Air veterans, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this winter evening lecture. Happy to see most of the Air Force is logged in. I hope you all are safe and uh, keeping warm at home. In our continuing efforts uh, at the Center for Air Power Studies to discuss and generate uh, a healthy debate on critical issues related to India's national security, we present to you our next speaker of eminent speaker series. We are happy to have Professor Brahmachalani. He is a very well-known uh, Delhi-based uh, geostrategist and author who won the Asia's uh, Asia Society's uh, 2012 Bernard Schwartz Book Award for his work, Water Asia's New Battleground, published by Georgetown University Press. Uh, he's a, a columnist for the uh, Project Syndicate. Uh, Chilani was uh, born in uh, New Delhi. He cleared his senior Cambridge uh, from uh, at Mount St. Mary School in Delhi, Kant. Did the Bachelor's uh, of Art Honours from uh, Hindu College, University of Delhi, and Master of Arts from Delhi School of Economics. Uh, he holds a PhD in International Arms Control. He's a Professor of Strategic Studies at New Delhi-based Center for Policy Research. Uh, Richard won uh, Vice Corps uh, a fellow with the Robert de Bosch Academy in Berlin and a non-resident affiliate with the International Center for Studies of Radicalization at King's uh, College London. In mid-2000s, he was a member of the Indian Government's Policy Advisory Group, which was uh, chaired by the External Affairs Minister of India. Before that, he was also an advisor on India's National Security uh, Council, serving as a convener of the External Security Group of the National Security Advisory Board. A professor was uh, described in New York Times International Herald Tribune in 1999 as one of the independent experts who helped draft India's proposed uh, nuclear doctrine. The country's draft doctrine, uh, nuclear doctrine was published, uh, publicly released in uh, August 1999. Among the institutions where he has held uh, appointments include Harvard University, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, the Brookings Institute, the Paul H. Nitz School of Advanced International Studies at uh, Johns uh, Hopkins University and the Australian National University. And I hope uh, I have not uh, missed out any uh, the Professor Ball's uh, works uh, uh, have uh, drawn attention from both academia and uh, the mainstream media. Uh, Graham Tobin from University of South Florida has uh, described Chilani's uh, geopolitical analysis as, as astute and critical. Many of us in the audience today, including myself, follow him on Twitter and read his views and writings. In fact, uh, just uh, less than an hour back, uh, at uh, 1637, I saw a tweet on uh, India's position on China and really appreciate uh, how strong, strong views he has on uh, when it comes to China. So he wrote a thesis uh, in early 2017 on China's uh, debt trap diplomacy, a concept and term that has uh, that he himself has coined. Uh, he's been writing on that subject again and again with updated facts and analysis. He describes how the Chinese government leverages the debt burden of smaller countries uh, for geopolitical ends. In a recent article, he quoted American statesman John Adams, who served as US, um, America's uh, president from 1797 to 1801 and had famously said, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. Now, China choosing the second path has embraced colonial era practices and rapidly emerged as the world's uh, biggest official creditor, he writes. Chiloni uh, saw debt trap uh, diplomacy in China's handling of Sri Lanka's debt uh, distress by taking over its uh, Hammond Tota port on a long-term lease in return for cash. Though some scholars did dispute the assessment, arguing that Chinese finance was not the source of the country's financial mess, uh, from the retweets uh, he has got, including from myself, one can make out that most of us agree with his assessment. A uh, professor has uh, also stated that India's recognition of Chinese uh, sovereignty over Tibet constitutes a single biggest security blunder. He has authored nine books, two of his most recent books relate to the geopolitics of water resources. Another book on international bestseller is an international bestseller uh, focuses on how 
a fast rising Asia uh, has become the defining fulcrum of uh, global geopolitical change. His uh, peer-reviewed papers have been published in very large number of uh, reputed journals. He's also a prolific newspaper essayist. Besides being a columnist for uh, Project Syndicate, he publishes regularly in the Globe and Mail, the Japanese Times, the Nikkei Asia, South China, Morning Post, Hindustan Times, and Times of India. He's also been a contributor to the Wall Street Journal and the Guardian and the New York Times and other newspapers and magazines. I think I have introduced him enough. Uh, we would have, uh, we wouldn't have had a, a more eminent person to talk to us on India's China challenge. Uh, at the end of his talk, there will be a Q&A session. I request you all to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, Master Gulani of CAPS, uh, he will coordinate the question and answer session. And so now over to the professor. Over to you, sir. Uh, you may wish to be, uh, unmute, sir. You are muted, uh, Professor Chilani. You are uh, still muted. You may kindly unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you uh, for that reminder. Um, yeah. This is the first time I'm on WebEx, so this is uh, a learning uh, session for me. But um, thank you, Air, Air Marshal Anil Chopra, for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. Also a pleasure to see all of you. Some of you have been friends, so it's very nice that all of you were able to join. What I intend to do is to provide a broad overview of India's um, China challenge. Issues that relate to the current developments between India and China, we can take up in the question and answer session. What I thought was that I should first provide the larger view, the overview of the kind of challenge that India faces vis-a-vis -vis China. As far as China's rise is concerned, just one word explains it, dramatic. It's been a very dramatic and swift rise. In fact, not since Japan rose in one generation as a world power in the second half of the 19th century, has another non-Western power emerged with such potential as China to alter the global order. China's rise, however, is very different from Japan's rise. When Japan rose to world power status during the Meiji era, the rest of Asia was in decline. In fact, much of Asia at, at that time was colonized. So there was no Asian power that could reign in Japan. By contrast, China has been rising at a time when the rest of Asia is also rising. When Japan emerged as a world power, imperial conquests followed. And China's rise has given rise to its new imperial agenda. But unlike Japan's imperial conquest, China has sought to achieve its new, new imperial objectives below the threshold of armed conflict in the 21st century. After all, in the 21st century, military conquest is not an acceptable thing. The People's Republic of China can truly be proud of its remarkable achievements in the period since it was founded 72 years ago. An impoverished backward state in 1949, it now commands respect and awe in the world. The four modernizations program under Deng Xiaoping drastically transformed China, including spurring its phenomenal economic rise. Mao led the party to power. Deng made the country prosperous, and now Xi Jinping wants China to gain global preeminence. That is, supplant the United States as the world's number one power by 2049, 
which will mark the centenary of communist rule. This is their sense of what Xi Jinping calls the Chinese dream. He has used this catchphrase, quote unquote, Chinese dream repeatedly. Territorially, Han power is at its zenith. If you look at the Great Wall, where, it, where it's located in China, the Great Wall as it exists today was built by the Ming Dynasty, mainly to denote the outer edge of the Han Empire's political frontiers. The Great Wall was designed to thought invasions, which historically came from the North and the West. Today's China is three times as large as it was under the last Han Dynasty. The last Han, Han Dynasty was the Ming Dynasty. And China's borders have extended far west and southwest of the Great Wall. As a result, its security calculus has changed fundamentally. China has never been so large territorially as it is today, other than when it was under foreign rule. During the Mongol Yuan Dynasty and later under the Manchu Qing Dynasty. Thus, in territorial size, Han Chinese power is at its pinnacle. For example, the ancient city of Kashgar in Chinese rule Xinjiang is closer to Baghdad than to Beijing. And Lhasa, Tibet's capital, is almost twice as far from Beijing as from Delhi. Another important fact is that China is today the world's largest, strongest, and longest surviving autocracy. This is a country increasingly oriented to the primacy of the Communist Party. To avoid the faith of the Soviet Union, which collapsed like a deck of cards, the interests of the CCP come ahead of the public interest. So stability overrides all else with a CCP system primarily designed to inspire fealty to the regime in Beijing, a regime that we all know that denies even basic dignity to those living under its rule. China's overriding focus on domestic order explains one unusual fact. China's budget for internal security is larger than even its official military budget. This is an astonishing fact. By their own figures, by the Chinese government's figures, China's budget for internal security is larger than its military budget. We know the military budget has grown rapidly to, to eclipse the defense spending of all other powers except the United States. China is the only important country whose internal security budget surpasses its national defense budget. China's increasingly repressive internal machinery, which is aided by a creeping Orwellian surveillance system, has fostered an overt strict an overt strategy to culturally smother ethnic minorities in their traditional homelands, including through demographic change and harsh policing. This in turn has led to the detention of more than a million Muslims from Xinjiang in internment camps for re-education. The Muslim Gulag in Xinjiang represents the largest mass incarceration of people on religious grounds since the Nazi area. Two successive US administrations, first the Trump administration and now the Biden administration, have defined these concentration camps in Xinjiang as representing genocide and crimes against humanity. We all know that in Pakistan, which is China's closest ally, 
the army has a country, right? We all know that in Pakistan, the army has a country. But in China, the party has an army. The PLA is the party's army. China does not have a national military. Rather, the party has a military. So the PLA has traditionally sworn fealty to the party, not the nation. What is the PLA's main mission? If you look at the US Defense Intelligence Agency's publicly released report of three years ago, the PLA's main task is to keep the Communist Party in power. The PLA, according to the report, exists to guarantee the CCP regime's survival above all else. In other words, for the PLA, serving the party takes precedence over serving the nation. And turning to, to the picture as in terms of PRC and the larger world, the PRC may have risen as a great power, but today, it finds itself at the crossroads with its future trajectory anything but certain. China faces a worrisome paradox. Because of its opaque repressive system, the more it globalizes, the more vulnerable it becomes internally. More fundamentally, the international factors that aided China's rise are eroding. China's rise happened, was aided considerably by several factors, including US policy. Now, those international factors are eroding. This means it will become more difficult for China to continue abusing free trade rules or to hide behind the argument that it remains a developing country, a developing economy, and thus is entitled to favorable treatment. And thanks to COVID-19, many countries have learned hard lessons about China-dependent supply chains and international attitudes toward China's communist regime are shifting. A majority of Americans now see China as the greatest threat. A majority of Americans, according to a recently released survey, and they rank Russia far behind, only 14% of Americans now see Russia as the biggest threat. And 72% of Americans say that the COVID virus likely leaked from a Wuhan lab. But more importantly, according to a Pew Research uh, Center survey, a global attitude survey released uh, last August, uh, six months ago, barely, Unfavorable views of China are at historic highs in almost all advanced economies. Turning to China and India, what in India and China were born around the same time, but the dissimilarities between the two are striking even in terms of their origins. The Republic of India was founded on the belief that it won independence through a struggle of non-violence. This is what Indian children are still taught in schools, that, that non-violence was the path to India's independence. In truth, the non-violent campaign led by Mahatma Gandhi was a significant factor, but not the decisive factor in India's gaining of independence. The decisive factor was the protracted World War II, which left Britain shattered even in victory. So after World War II, Britain left almost all its colonies, one by one, irrespective of whether these colonies waged violent struggles or non-violent struggles, or no struggles at all. There were some 
colonies that gain independence that had waged no struggle at all for independence. But India's founding conviction gave rise to a pacifist India that believed that it could get peace by seeking peace, not by building the requisite capabilities to defend peace. So the founding myth, India's founding myth, exacted significant costs. The consequence of those pacifist blinkers was the disappearance of the vast Tibetan plateau as the buffer with China, the loss of one third of the original princely state of Jammu and Kashmir to Pakistan, and another one fifth of JNK to China, and India's 1962 rout by the invading Chinese army. Had India been proactive and forward looking, it could have settled the Himalayan border before communist China was born. India had ample time to force things and present China with a faith company. Historic opportunities, as we know, rarely repeat themselves. For more than two years after India became independent, China was in chaos. China was in, was in chaos because there was a raging civil war that was racking China. Even after the communists came to power in October 1949, they took slightly more than one year to begin the invasion of Tibet. The Chinese communists had telegraphed their intentions to annex Tibet even before seizing power in Beijing. In other words, India had an open field for more than two years after it gained independence to assert control over the traditional Himalayan borders and to cement its extraterritorial rights in Tibet. But India's pernicious founding myth hobbled its strategic thinking. When it started its invasion of Tibet, the People's Liberation Army was a ragtag force of ill-equipped and undernourished guerrillas. The PLA managed to overwhelm Tibetan defenses through numerical superiority. The Indian Army, by contrast, was a professional and battle-hardened force at that time that had fought for the British Empire in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Southeast Asia. When, when India became independent, it had more than a million battle-hardened soldiers who had fought in World War II. Yet, despite, the, despite having the best professional force in Asia at that time, India did not secure its borders. Instead, in 1954, India tamely surrendered it, its British inherited extraterritorial rights in Tibet without any quid pro quo, not even Beijing's acceptance of the then prevailing Indo-Tibetan border. Not many know this, that India had military outposts in Tibet at, at Yatung and Gyantse and that India was running Tibet's postal telegraph and public telephone services. Under the so-called Panchil Agreement of 1954, India shut its military outposts and handed over Tibet's postal telegraph and public telephone services to the Chinese government. If I could just show you one, um, one map it tells you, it captures how, you know, how significant the fall of um, um, Tibet was. Uh, I'm not able to, 
present the slide for some reason here. Uh, it's, it's open. Open. To share it down below. There is a share. Yes, I, I press the share and it says go to system preferences and then. Um, interesting. Yeah, one minute. Just give me a second. Let me see what the issue here is. This is the first time, as I said, I'm using uh, uh, WebEx. So. OK, yes, uh, it's it's there. Oh. OK, um, it, it says quit and reopen. Uh, if I quit and reopen, then I'll lose connection with you, right? Um, anyway, I, I think um, I will uh, skip the PowerPoint slides that I have because um, I'm going to lose the connection. It, it wants me to quit WebEx and 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 then re-log in. So I'll skip that. So um, so in the map of Asia, if you look at the Tibetan Plateau, the Tibetan Plateau is at the is an, is at the heart of Asia. It was it's a huge plateau, and the fall of Tibet represented the most profound and far-reaching geopolitical development in India's modern history. At first, it enabled China to impose itself as India's neighbor. So China became India's neighbor not due to geography. It became India's neighbor through annexation of Tibet. And the fall of Tibet brought Indian security under intense pressure on two separate fronts. The fall of Tibet also led to China's trans-Himalayan aggression invasion of 1962 and its current border aggression. More broadly, the Chinese annexation of Tibet changed Asia's water map. There have been other examples in history of um, the region's water map being fundamentally changed through occupation of a critical area. For example, in the Six Day War of 1967, Israel changed the water map of its sub region by occupying the Golan Heights, which is the starting point of the Jordan River, and by annexing or occupying. Uh, the West Bank, which sits on underground water, you know, the aquifer system. Uh, but China's annexation of Tibet changed the water map of an entire continent. This has never happened before in history, not just in modern history, but in history in general. So the fall of Tibet was geopolitically a very significant development. Over the years, as we all know, India may have become more realistic. But the continuing lack of a strategic culture in India, which has been highlighted by many scholars, is linked to the country's founding belief. Now, in contrast to independent India, the PRC was born in blood, but the Red Army's march to victory, cutting a vast swath of debt and destruction. Not only was the PRC born in blood, it was built on blood, with Mao and fellow revolutionaries ever ready to employ force internally and externally. No sooner had the new China been established than it more than doubled its territorial size by forcibly absorbing Xinjiang and the Tibetan Plateau. So the by occupying Xinjiang and Tibetan Plateau in 1949, 1950, 1951, in, in, in the first few years of, its, of the PRC establishment, the PRC more than doubled its territorial size. Domestically, a violent communist victory bred more violence. That resulted in three decades of mass killings. The Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution Living millions dead 
million dead. China launched the 1962 Himalayan War with India after Mao's great leap forward created the worst man-made famine in world history. The resulting damage to Mao's credibility at home, according to the Chinese scholar Wang Jixi, served as a strong incentive for Mao to reassert leadership through a war. The Great Leap Forward policy led to the deaths of up to 45 million Chinese, according to the historian Frank Nicotter. So the greatest genocide in modern history was not the Holocaust. The Holocaust was terrible. But the greatest genocide in modern history was the Great Leap Forward. Another important difference with India is that the PRC first concentrated on acquiring military muscle. By the time Deng Xiaoping launched his economic modernization program, China already had tested its first ICBM, the 12,000 kilometer Dongfeng 5, and developed a thermonuclear weapon. In other words, like other great powers in modern history, and China was not the first part doing this, but like other great powers in modern history, China became a global military player before it became a global economic player. China's military power base was built by Mao, enabling Deng, enabling Deng to single-mindedly focus on rapidly building economic power. The remarkable economic rise in turn has armed China with even greater resources to expand its military power. China's defense strategy since the Mao era has been founded on a simple premise. The premise is that the capacity to defend oneself with one's own resources is the first test a nation has to pass on the way to becoming a great power. This premise needs to be understood in India. The capacity to defend oneself with one's own resources is the first test a nation has to pass on the way to becoming a great power. So even when China was poor, it consciously put the accent on building comprehensive national power. Turning to the situation prevailing today, Xi Jinping has set out to complete the expansionist agenda that Mao left unfinished. This is, this is, this is why he has not spared even tiny Bhutan. Bhutan is China's smallest neighbor, but under Xi Jinping, China has been encroaching on Bhutanese territory. In fact, Xi Jinping has sought to model himself on Mao. Like Mao thought, Xi Jinping thought, as you know, has been enshrined in China's constitution and made the central doctrine guiding the CCP and guiding the PLA. After all, you know, the, C the PLA is under the CCP. So the Xi Jinping thought is the doctrine guiding the CCP and in turn guiding the PLA. In other words, Xi Jinping is, is China's new Mao. Under Xi Jinping, China has emerged as an angry expansionist power that pursues wolf warrior tactics and as the chair air marshal Chopra mentioned, and death trap diplomacy. It also flouts international law at will. And the international costs of Xi Jinping's despotism are apparent from the devastating consequences of the China, of the China originating pandemic. A massive cover up in China to obscure the genesis of the COVID virus to suggest the world may never know the truth on how this virus originated. 
But knowing how this virus originated is very important to prevent another pandemic, especially another coronavirus pandemic, because this is the third coronavirus pandemic of, of this century. First, we had SARS, which also originated in China. Then we had MERS, and now we have COVID-19. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that China's image has been dented, forcing the country to increasingly rely on its coercive power. But instead of undertaking a course correction, Xi Jinping is doubling down on his actions as underscored by China's stepped up bullying of Taiwan. After China's success in swallowing Hong Kong, redrawing the geopolitical map of the South China Sea, and changing the territorial status quo in the Malian borderlands with India, Nepal, and Bhutan, risk is growing that Xi Jinping's expansionism could make Taiwan its next target. <coughs> Now, let me now briefly turn to China's military strategy. <clears throat> offense as defense. Offense as defense has been the guiding principle of China's expansionism under communist rule. Offense in the name of defense still remains the strategy. You would recall how China, after carrying out its encroachments on Ladakh's borderlands by stealth in April, May of 2020, began accusing India of aggression. This is a fence in the name of defense. A Pentagon report published 10 years ago, in fact, longer than that, published in 2020, 2010, gives specific examples of how China has carried out military preemption in the name of defense. These examples include intervention in the Korean War, the attack on India in 1962, its initiation of a border conflict with the Soviet Union through a military ambush in 1969, its invasion of Vietnam in 1979, and the capture of the Parasol Islands in 1974. Add to the list China's capture of the Johnson South Reef in 1988, the Mischief Reef in 1995, the Scarborough Shoal in 2012, and its creation of seven man-made militarized islands in the South China Sea in the period between 2013 and 2017. Offense in the name of defense is just one of five key elements defining Chinese military strategy. The other elements are deception, shrewd timing, tactical surprise, that is bringing a surprise on an unprepared enemy, and using military force in a concentrated manner so as to achieve a swift result. These five elements have characterized all military actions by the PRC since 1949. Now, if you look at deception, deception is an accepted military practice, a military deception. Every military is taught how to practice military deception. But communist China has a strategic culture that values, even in peacetime, deception, surprise, and aggression. Deception, surprise, and aggression have defined China's Ladakh encroachments of 2020. That is why we have a major border crisis today with China. Respect for existing boundaries is a prerequisite to peace and stability on any continent. Europe has built its peace on that principle. A number of European states are unhappy with the boundaries that they have, but they've learned to live with these boundaries, with boundaries that they don't like. 
But the CCP under Xi Jinping is still engaged in redrawing frontiers by force. The best and the most expensive example is the South China Sea, where China has pushed its maritime borders far out into, in, into international waters. One aspect of China's strategy common to all its territorial claims is to give a Chinese name to a claimed area so as to lend support to its claim. For example, the name South Tibet that China conjured up for India's Arunachal Pradesh is of 2006 vintage. You would have never not heard of this South Tibet phrase before 2006. More recently, China has switched to the synthesized name of South Tibet, Zhangnan for Arunachal Pradesh. So in recent uh, weeks, for example, the Chinese propaganda, the official propaganda, has used Zagnan for Arunachal Pradesh. How many had heard the name Dai Yu before China began aggressively asserting its claim to the Japanese controlled Senkaku Islands? Now, if you look up any international media report on the Senkaku Islands, they always say, the Senkaku Islands, which China calls the Dayu Islands. So even though the word, the name Dayu is of more recent vintage, yet it has caught on internationally. And, and, and therefore, this is the way China seeks to lend support to its claims. Everybody now recognizes in the world that the Senkaku Islands are a disputed island, are disputed islands. Similarly, Increasingly now, not, not all um, media organizations, but m many of them now refer to Ar Arunachal Pradesh as a disputed region. The fact is that China's territorial assertiveness and expansionism have become intertwined with its national renewal. This pursuit of the Chinese dream is the national renewal that is being pursued by the, Xi, by the Xi Jinping regime. China has sought to extend its control to strategic territories and resources as part of a shrewd high-stakes strategy to build political, economic, and military preeminence in Asia. So, so Xi Jinping's promise of national greatness and prosperity embodied in the catchphrase, the Chinese dream, is tied as much to internal progress as to achieving Asian primacy. So this crisis with India, this, you know, these encroachments and challenging India now by raising the specter of war are designed to make India accept a secondary role in, in a Sino-centric Asia. There's a larger geopolitical agenda that's driving China's aggression against India. And it's much broader than India. As you all know, that China is subverting the status quo in the South and East China Seas, uh, and even the flows of international rivers. It's, you know, it's even changing the flows of international rivers, re-engineering their flows. And it's doing all that without firing a single shot. It has redrawn the geopolitical map of the South China Sea without firing a single shot. It encroached on India's borderlands in Ladakh in 2020 without firing a single shot. It has turned the Senkaku Islands into international dispute without firing a single shot. It, is, it has dammed the Mekong River to such an extent that now recurrent droughts and floods have become common and the downstream countries of Southeast Asia are dependent on Chinese goodwill, all without firing a single shot. But the important thing to remember is that the subversion of the status quo is being done not through one, but not through one stroke, through incremental steps. 
usually these are furtive incremental steps the strategy focuses on a steady progression of incremental steps none of which serves as a cause of war by itself yet which over time lead cumulatively to a strategic transformation in china's favor now even if you look at the ladakh encroachments the encroachments happened the first encroachments happened in april of 2020 and then when india realized what had happened and rush forces china then encroached in other areas in may 2020 so they used deception you know they first they used deception through an exercise military exercise then they used deception further by making india believe that the areas that they had encroached upon are the only areas that they wish to safeguard uh, so there was a double game of deception military deception that led to to two successive rounds of encroachments in April and May of 2020. But speaking more broadly, China's salami slice approach seriously limits the options of rival states because it confounds their deterrence plans. It makes it difficult for rival states to devise proportionate or effective counteractions. This in part is because the strategy seeks to ensure that the initiative remains with China. You can call it the art of stealth war. This art of stealth war that China has demonstrated undercuts even the relevance of US security assurances to its allies like Japan and the Philippines. For example, if you look at the capture of the Scarborough Shore from the Philippines in 2012, the Philippines has a mutual defense treaty with the United States. What did the Americans do? They stayed silent because this is this is the way China not only practices but implements <clears throat> its uh, its art of stealth war. And for a country like India, which has a defensive mindset and approach, this means staying at the receiving end of China's moves. The Chinese pattern to disturb the status quo has by now become obvious. Manufacture a dispute, launch periodic incursions into that area, increase the frequency of such incursions, and step up the duration of the incursions, all designed to present the opponent to cut a deal on China's terms. This is in keeping with China's preferred approach to territorial disputes. That approach can be summed up in one line. What is ours is ours, but what is yours is negotiable. Now this approach is very clearly in motion against Japan in relation to the Senkaku Islands. So these incursions, first their frequency increased, now the duration of those incursions uh, is increasing, all designed to pressure Japan to come to the negotiating table. In fact, any targeted state is presented with a Hobson's choice, either endure China's intrusions or risk a war with an emerging great power. This is the choice, for example, the Philippines has faced since China seized the Scarborough Shore. Add to the picture one other factor. China's hybrid warfare. As a recent Pentagon report to the US Congress has underlined, the hybrid warfare is enshrined in China's official strategy as the three warfares doctrine. China calls it the three warfares doctrine. The three warfares being legal warfare, also known as lawfare, psychological warfare, and info warfare, in, in info war. Now, all three types of warfare, China has been of late been waiting against India. Just as the pen can be mightier than the sword, the non-kinetic 
free warfare seek to advance Xi Jinping's expansionism without China having to start a shooting war. In other words, the free warfare doctrine blurs the line between war and peace. Such bulletless aggression, bulletless aggression is proving a game changer in the Asian battle space. And waging the three warfares in conjunction with military operations has yielded China's significant territorial gains from the South China Sea to the Himalayas. So against this background, it's clear that China possesses a growing challenge for India. There can be no two, two views on that. And India is locked in a very defensive posture vis-a-vis -vis China. Militarily and diplomatically, China has created a situation in which it retains the initiative. That is the ability to strike, the ability to spring a surprise at a time of its choosing. Now looking ahead, and I, I think I have only um, three, four minutes left. So <clears throat> let me sum up by, by looking at <coughs> where China's headed. You can take about 10 minutes, no problem. Yes. Okay, 10 minutes, okay. Yeah. In, in, the, in that case, um, if I could just uh, put in a comment on India. Erring on the side of caution is always prudent. All of us should, you know, should seek to err on the side of caution. And if you are a nation state, certainly erring on the side of caution is always wise. <clears throat> but not as, what is not wise is strategic diffidence. Strategic diffidence and tentativeness tend to exact serious costs. The more reckless a policy, the more pressures it is bound to invite. Now we can blame China for what it is doing to India. But we should also look at our own faults, at our own shortcomings. Now just consider one example. Beijing openly plays the debit card against India. The umpteen ways Beijing uses the debit card against India range from claiming Arunachal Pradesh and some areas in Ladakh to be part of Tibet and thus part of China to periodically pressing India to curb the Dalai Lama's activities. In China has even shortened the length of the Indo-Tibetan border so as to question India's territorial sovereignty in the eastern and western sectors. Yet no Indian government has cared to remind Beijing that the resolution of the India-China disputes hinges on China's addressing of the core issue of Tibet. So here is China, which says a large Indian state is South Tibet, and yet India till this day asserts that Tibet is an integral part of China. Can there be a stance more self-injurious than this? Now looking at Looking at um, where communist China is headed, there are at least five different scenarios that are conceivable about China's future. Scenario one is what I would call rebalancing to preserve the current order. In this scenario, the CCP protects its legitimacy, keeps the military subordinate, and manages to put a lid on popular dissent. In other words, the status quo prevails for the foreseeable future, guaranteeing China's rising strength and unity. 
This scenario will be in keeping with Xi Jinping's quote unquote, the Chinese dream. Scenario two can be can be titled implosion. Implosion. Authorities in China are willing to go to any extent to carry out internal repression to perpetuate one party rule and maintain control. The government is fixated on internal security and stability to avoid a Sino a, uh, to avoid a Soviet style implosion. So the likelihood of political disintegration, economic collapse and social order doesn't seem high. So, you know, you, 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 it doesn't look at the probability of, of, of um, China going the Soviet way, like, like you know, imploding suddenly that likelihood doesn't doesn't appear high. A scenario three is guided reform. In this scenario, a process of gradual political change begins. This scenario may look unlikely under Xi Jinping. After all, Xi Jinping is anything but a political reformer. But things can happen suddenly. For example, think of Xi Jinping's unexpected death or his overthrow. Either, either development could usher in new leadership that heralds political reforms. And by the way, Xi Jinping has not left China in two years. In three days, in three three days from now, it'll be two years since Xi Jinping last left China. He left China uh, for Myanmar on 15th of January 2020, just as the pandemic began, or just before the pandemic be was was acknowledged um, by China uh, in terms of the COVID outbreak in, in China. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, why hasn't he gone anyway? He skipped even the recent uh, G7, uh, not the G7, the G20 summit in, in Rome. They are, according to reliable uh, reports, he, he generally fears that he might be deposed from power if he leaves China. So he, at the moment, he's, he's, he's trying to, um, he's trying to root out all possible enemies um, that he can find within China. Scenario four is great leap backward. That's what I would call it, great leap backward. A new cultural revolution erupts amid a no holds barred power struggle within the party. The clique in power ruthlessly seeks to suppress dissent within and outside the establishment. Given China's cutthroat politics, this scenario cannot be ruled out. In fact, we have seen some very uh, disturbing um, examples of late. Last month, for example, a 99-foot statue of Lord Buddha in the Tibetan region of Sichuan was demolished by the Chinese authorities. According to a news report, this demolition, which has been verified by satellite imagery, this demolition was done to teach the teach the Tibetans a lesson. This, this is like this is like you know, this is like what happened during the Cultural Revolution. So great leap forward as a as a scenario. It's a science, it's a scenario that that is certainly possible. And the fifth scenario is the military starts to call the political shots. Military, as I mentioned, is subservient to the party. It's the party's military. So the military beginning to call the political shots would be a major transformation in China. This would parallel what happened in, in Imperial Japan 
when it rose dramatically as an economic and political power in one generation after the ninth, after the 1868 Meiji Restoration. Uh, Japan at that time, you know, it was it, it, its um, its military power and its um, you know its, its its strength was boosted by war victories against Manchu ruled China and and Tsarist Russia, and and those victories and its own growing capabilities prompted the Japanese military to gradually dictate terms to the civilian government, opening the path to imperial conquests. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, can the PLA really upstage the CCP? The fact is that the party today is ideologically adrift and becoming more dependent than ever on the PLA for its political legitimacy and more importantly, to ensure domestic order. Xi Jinping has repeatedly called for the military to remain subordinate to the party. Ask yourself, why would the president of China repeatedly call on the PLA to remain subordinate to the party, you know, to obey the party's diktats, unless there were some concerns that he had? And Xi Jinping has purged many generals and admirals. Some say the figure is in score, some say it's in hundreds. We don't know the number, but many generals and admirals have been purged suggesting that he fears being deposed from power by the military. This scenario of the PLA seizing the reins of power or running the country from behind a civilian mask is worrisome for China's neighbors because it means China will remain an aggressive and expansionist power even if such a transformation were to happen. So it's 